Right, welcome to the second lecture on general philosophy. Uh, this uh, completes the sort of general survey of historical change in concepts, uh, which is mainly occupying these first two lectures. Uh, and I want to stress that I consider this history to be absolutely crucial to getting a proper understanding of the topics that we cover in general philosophy. That will become more evident as we go through. Uh, the pictures here, we've got Descartes, of course, on the left, uh, then Thomas Hobbes, who enters the story today, Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and Albert Einstein. Now, you may well think that at least three of these are far better known as scientists than philosophers, uh, but their ideas are of profound significance for philosophical thinking about these things. Okay, first of all, a reminder. We came across Descartes last week. Um, he had a brilliant idea, a synthesis, that brought together the ideal of mechanism with an explanation of one of those, these very puzzling phenomena, the motion of the moon around the earth, the planets around the sun. Uh, he denied the Aristotelian idea uh, that bodies in nature, like stones or planets, uh, are motivated by something like purposes, striving to reach the center of the universe or something like that. Uh, matter for Descartes, as for Galileo, is simply passive. His idea is that the essence of matter is extension, extendedness in space. And that immediately means that space is a plenum. There is no empty space because wherever you have extended space, you've got matter. It follows that the motion of matter can only go in vortices. And therefore, you've got an explanation of the motion of the planets around the sun and so forth. As for mind, uh, the essence of mind is quite distinct. The essence of mind is thinking. Mind is not extended, matter is. So it's a completely distinct kind of substance, and importantly for some, at least as he presents it at the beginning of the meditations, uh, this makes room for immortality. He's very keen to promote his text as suitable for teaching in religious seminaries and so on. So making space for immortality is pretty crucial. But actually, in many ways, the most important aspect of Descartes' work was taking mind, strivings and things, out of physical science. So, we're going to be talking quite a bit today about physicalism. And I want to, uh, first of all, introduce that in contrast with Cartesian dualism, named after Descartes. So, Cartesian dualism, you have physical bodies that consist of material substance. You've got minds, quite distinct, consisting of immaterial substance, thinking stuff. By contrast, materialism, nowadays it tends to be called physicalism, is the view that there's only one kind of substance, namely material substance or physical substance. Notice, although I won't be saying much about this today, this is compatible with having a distinction between physical and mental properties. So you could say, uh, we consist entirely of material substance, but amongst our properties are mental properties as well as physical properties. So you can have a dualism of properties uh, compatibly with being a materialist. So Thomas Hobbes comes in as a notorious figure, uh, better known today for his political theory. He's still very, very prominent in uh, reading lists on political theory, as many of you may know. Um, so, um, we have his portrait in Hartford College because he went to Magdalen Hall, which morphed into Hartford College. So he's an Oxford man. He, he was like Descartes a plenist. He believed that the world was uh, full of material substance, but he denied that mind is immaterial. Uh, so incorporeal substance, he claims, is just a contradiction in terms. Um, and you can see here he's making fun of Descartes. When men make a name of two names whose significations are contradictory and inconsistent, the result is but insignificant sounds. As this name, an incorporeal body 
or which is all one, an incorporeal substance. He's taking Descartes' theory and he's providing it in Leviathan as a paradigm example of an abuse of words. Now, this was obviously very shocking. The obvious reason, if you are a materialist, it makes it very hard to maintain either a belief in God, I mean, it follows that God is a material substance, which for most people is going to be tantamount to denying that there is a God, um, but also it obviously seriously threatens immortality. Uh, so in the 17th century, uh, this is thought seriously disruptive to morality. If you deny a, a future state, uh, heaven and hell, then what motive is there for people being moral in this life? So lots of philosophers, as you can see, and these are only the most prominent ones, lined up to refute Hobbes. So Leviathan came out in 1651. Uh, we have a large number of responses to Leviathan attacking Hobbes' materialism. Now, the main argument against Hobbes, and this still resonates, by the way, in 21st century debates, when people ask questions about whether uh, computers could think or whether they could be conscious. A common argument that comes out is that there is something inconsistent with the idea of matter thinking. And back in the 17th century and the 18th century, indeed, uh, this went along with the idea that we have seen from science that matter is inert. Aristotle was wrong, Galileo was right. Uh, matter just keeps moving at the same speed in the same direction unless it's added upon, acted upon by a force. Uh, of course, that's a major plank of Newton's theory that will come along later. Uh, so, but if matter is inert, then it can't have active powers like thinking. Um, and in that case, it follows that the world cannot be purely material. We cannot be purely material, indeed. But notice that this argument assumes that we can understand the powers of matter a priori. Now, it's worth clarifying this term a priori. It's a very important one. It crops up a lot in philosophy. Um, so I'm going to give you a dictionary definition of it here. A belief or claim is said to be justified a priori if its epistemic justification, the reason or warrant for thinking it to be true, does not depend at all on sensory or introspective or other sorts of experience. Whereas if its justification does depend, at least in part, on such experience, it is said to be justified a posteriori or empirically. This specific distinction has to do only with the justification of the belief and not at all with how the constituent concepts are acquired. Okay, that last sentence is very important. Uh, so a standard example of an a priori truth is all bachelors are unmarried. Okay, we define a bachelor as an unmarried man, so we can know a priori uh, that all bachelors are unmarried. Now clearly we cannot get the concept of a bachelor except through experience. If you didn't have any experience, you wouldn't have the concept of a man, you certainly wouldn't have the concept of marriage. But the crucial point, what makes it a priori, is that having acquired those concepts, you don't then need to consult experience to find out whether it's true or false that all bachelors are unmarried. You can just see by examining the concepts that that's the case. Okay, so an a priori truth is something that you can know to be true without any justification from experience. And this argument against Hobbes, that matter could not possibly think, is relying on an a priori claim. Because it's not saying, look, by experience we can tell that matter doesn't think. And that's no good. Because Hobbes is going to say, on the contrary, we know by experience that matter can think. Because I'm a matter and I can think. So this argument is based on an a priori claim about the powers of matter. And we'll see that that's a problem. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So Robert Boyle, a very, very influential scientist in the 17th century. Um, he was actually a pioneer of chemistry. And he was very much a champion of the mechanical philosophy. But unlike Descartes and Hobbes, he was not a plenist. 
he did not think that the universe is completely full up with matter. He thought uh, that there was stuff called universal matter uh, formed into corpuscles, what we would think of as atoms, but the word atom in those days was associated with Greek atom atomism, which was notoriously atheist. So he preferred the word corpuscularianism. So you've got corpuscles, little, think of them as atoms made of stuff, universal matter, but they are inside a void. So the universe as a whole is empty except where you have these material corpuscles. And everything that we see in the world is the result of interactions of these little corpuscles. And clearly the, the kind of corpuscles that make up gold are going to be different from the corpuscles that make up lead. Uh, maybe a different size, maybe a different shape, maybe put together in a different order. But essentially you've got something like an, an atomic theory, um, but importantly uh, a distinction between empty space and matter. Another bit of the scientific story, which we'll see, this all comes together very shortly. So a chap called Tycho Brahe, um, a Danish astronomer, had built an observatory on an island, and he, he, he was a nobleman, and he created astronomical instruments, naked eye, that were far, far more accurate than any that had previously been devised. And over many years, he plotted the paths of the planets. And then Johannes Kepler, who started out as Brahe's assistant, inherited all that data, did some very clever mathematics, and discovered that the data were actually most consistent with the hypothesis that the planets move around the sun, not in circles, but in ellipses, with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. So I've drawn a little image of something, what it's like. Now, Kepler published tables, astronomical tables, based on his calculations, predicting where the planets would be in the sky at any particular time. Now, prior to this, uh, the tables that had been published based on Aristotle's theory, um, and later on Copernicus, which was sort of, it's still fundamentally based on circles, uh, were only of limited accuracy. And sometimes you might look, look up in the sky, you see a planet in roughly the right place, but maybe it's five degrees out. Kepler's tables were more than a thousand times more accurate. They were phenomenally accurate. And you've got to remember that this was done without the aid of telescopes. Quite remarkable. Now, over time, as people became aware that these tables were so fantastically accurate, it became accepted that actually the planets were moving in ellipses around the sun, not circles. I mean, Galileo had already done for the Aristotelian theory. What Kepler did was show that the astronomical uh, bodies do not move in circles but ellipses. And this is where Isaac Newton comes in. Because what Newton did was to show that if you have a force between bodies which is proportional to their mass and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And if you have one very large body and one very much smaller body, the smaller body will move under the action of that force in an ellipse around the larger body, with the larger body at a focus of the ellipse. That's on the assumption that force equals mass times acceleration. Moreover, he showed that the same equations with the same constants worked for cannonballs on Earth and worked for the Moon and worked for the planets. Another thing he showed, this is all in his famous Principia Mathematica, he showed that, that a vortex cannot generate elliptical motion. So Descartes' theory is in the bin. Now, all this might seem some distance from philosophy, but think back to that important argument against Hobbes. And as I say, that's an argument that still resonates today in discussions of mind and consciousness. Newton has postulated a force. He's got very strong evidence for it, too. It fits with the data brilliantly. He's postulated a force that acts as a distant, at a distance 
between bodies with no intermediate mechanical connection. <coughs> but this seems completely unintelligible. Okay? Descartes, in arguing against the Aristotelians, had said this, this idea of strivings, you know, a body striving to reach the centre of the earth is ridiculous. The body would have to be conscious. It would have to know where the centre of the earth is. Um, well, exactly the same applies to gravity. If you've got two bodies in space, how can this one be attracted to this one unless it somehow knows where it is? Uh, if you've got no mechanical interaction between them, how do you explain gravity? Now, the real problem here is, it, it, it's not so much, okay, well, we just have to accept this unknown force, this strange force, gravity. You know, we, we have evidence that it exists, but we've no idea how. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that if matter can have an active force like gravity, why couldn't it have an active power like thinking? Once you allow that matter can have all sorts of properties that we can't understand, uh, materialism is far harder to attack. So Newton famously said hypotheses non-fingo. That can be interpreted in various ways, but he seems to be saying, my equations work, I'm not going to worry uh, about what the mechanism is, how it all works, um, until I've got some data to base that on. But as I say, um, it has a real consequence for the argument about materialism. So one thing I want to really emphasize here is that scientific progress over the early modern period systematically pushed us progressively away from a natural and intuitive understanding of things. And this has carried on in later science. So Aristotle started from the very natural, nice idea that we can understand the way things in nature work, both on the assumption that they've been designed intelligently and that they are quasi-intelligent themselves. You know, they strive to achieve certain purposes. Galileo refuted that. Uh, Descartes tried to get a theory uh, which was compatible with simple mechanism, whereby things work in intelligible ways, by one part, piece of matter pushing on another, uh, in vortices and so on. We can understand that. We feel that's intelligible. And then we get Kepler and Newton showing that that's, that just seems to be wrong. Okay? The mathematics just doesn't work with empirical observation. So we end up having to have this gravitational force which seems completely unintelligible. And we can understand it, understand it, inverted commas, to the extent of calculating what its upshot is, but we've no idea at all where it comes from or how matter generates it. And I'm not going to describe um, this in any detail, but we see the same in 20th century physics. Right? General relativity, we get the idea of space being linked intimately with time and somehow being curved, which most of us find extraordinarily difficult to get our heads around. Uh, quantum mechanics, uh, fundamental particles. Well, are they particles? They're very weird. Um, their behavior is describable, but it's not really intelligible. So although physics retains the goal of accurate prediction and explanation of a sort, it seems somehow to give up on making sense of things. So just spell that out. In science, we often talk about explaining something when we have formulae that generate the observation. And we can say, ah, that observation is consistent with our theory, because look, we've done this calculation and it works out. We've explained it. That's not the same as rendering it intelligible. If the equations that we're using are ones that seem deeply unintuitive to us, uh, then we may resist the idea that we really understand what's going on. And obviously, philosophers can ask serious questions about this notion of understanding. I'm not going to have time to go into that deeply now. I just want to illustrate, for those of you who might not know about it, um, here is a simulation of the two-slit experiment. So Thomas Young uh, devised this experiment. Um, what he found was that if you take a source of light, by the way, it's monochromatic light. I'll explain the colors in a moment. Uh, you've got a single source of light there, and the light is hitting a screen which has two slits in it. Uh, and then at the back of the apparatus, there's another, uh, uh, another screen 
And what you get if you shine light through like that, as you can see at the top, you end up with bands of light. OK. Now, that was taken to be very strong evidence for a wave theory of light. Uh, and now, by the way, the colors are indicating where we are through a wavelength. So we're kind of going around the color spectrum each wavelength. And so they enable me to highlight the interference. And the brighter they are, the, uh, the bigger the amplitude. So what's going on here is, if you imagine dropping two pebbles into a pond some distance apart, each of the pebbles will cause a wave moving out from where you've dropped it. And if you've got waves from this pebble and waves from this pebble, then when they interact, uh, they can either do so destructively, so this wave is um, high up and this one's in a trough and they kind of cancel out, or sometimes you can have um, a trough in this wave and a trough in this one and you end up with a deeper trough. So, the kind of pattern you get from this interference is like that. And you can see it nicely explains where we get light on the screen at the back. That's where the, the two light sources are constructively interfering rather than destructively interfering. OK, well, that's very nice. But then um, it was discovered, early 20th century, that light kind of comes in particles. You, can, you cannot get less than a certain amount of any particular wavelength of light. They come, the particles are called photons, which are sort of packages of light. And whenever you try to detect light, you only ever detect it in terms of these photons. So if you take a, a faint enough light, uh, you will only ever detect it at one particular place. Now, once that's discovered, um, we can rethink our experiment and we send the light through the apparatus one photon at a time. In other words, we make sure that the light is so weak that at any particular time we only detect it at one point if we put detectors there. And what's rather surprising is that we still get an interference pattern. Now, that's weird, right? Because we're only sending the light out one photon at a time. It can only go through one slit at most. And yet, somehow, we're still getting an interference pattern. That seems spooky. Um, all right, well, let's add detectors to the two slits. So now we're sending individual photons through the apparatus but we've added detectors so that we can tell which slit the photon is going through. And sure enough, it only ever goes through one. But now, as you can see, the interference pattern disappears. So it's, it's very odd. You try to think of photons of light as particles, or you try to think of them as waves. And either way, I'm afraid our natural understanding uh, fails to do it. If you, you, you have to think of them as some strange mixture of particles and waves, something very unfamiliar to our experience. Um, we can do the mathematics, by the way. Um, where are we? Show probability distribution. You get a different... We, so we can work out... We can do the mathematics to explain what will happen. Of course, that maths is built into this computer program. Um, but trying to get an intuitive understanding of it, trying to think of it in terms of either waves in water or little billiard balls or whatever, just completely fails. So that's a very important lesson. Uh, as science has developed, it's actually shown serious limitations to our intuitive understanding to explain how the world fundamentally is. OK. Let's now go back to physicalism. So the kind of physicalism that Thomas Hobbes adopted, materialism, 17th century materialism, seemed very straightforward. Everything that exists consists of matter, and matter is spatially extended, uniform, solid stuff, whose causal interactions are purely mechanical. 
Okay, so people like Descartes and Hobbes knew what they meant by matter. Then along came Newton, and matter becomes a bit more complicated. Now we've got forces acting on it, forces like gravity, where we can't really render intelligible how that works. We can produce equations, but we can't give any commonsensical understanding of why one body attracts another across millions of miles. Of course, after Newton, uh, with modern physics, we find that matter isn't any solid uniform material stuff. It's not like boil thought. You haven't got corpuscles made of universal matter, differing only in their shape, size, and texture. Uh, actually, you've got a variety of fundamental particles. Some of them are masslets. Some of them seem point-like. Uh, and they have properties like charge and spin, even strangeness. And they operate within a space-time continuum, relativity, uh, which seems, from quantum mechanics, to be indeterministic. So the when we think of matter now, when we discuss physicalism, you know, can physical stuff produce mind, we're asking a different kind of question from what Hobbes was asking, because we've got such a different concept of matter. And this leads to something like Hem something called Hempel's Dilemma. So, take the claim, everything in the universe is physical. There is no non-physical stuff in the universe. What does that claim mean? Does it mean everything is physical in the sense that we currently understand physical? Well, that's probably false, because our current physics is probably false, at least in part. Not least because general relativity and quantum mechanics have not yet been rendered consistent. So it's very unlikely that everything is physical in a way that conforms to our current physical theory. On the other hand, if we mean, oh, everything is physical in the sense of conforming to what the ideal, eventual, perfect physical theory will be, well, then it begins to look kind of true by definition that everything is physical. Because maybe in that true theory, you know, everything will be in there, including minds, by the way. And why not? So it's very, very difficult to put the thesis of materialism or physicalism in a way that doesn't beg questions. We think we understand what we're saying when we say that everything is physical. But actually, it's not so clear that we do. OK, we'll return to the, this important question, mind, body, and physicalism, in a later lecture. I now want to talk about uh, our understanding of our own place in the world. And here, Charles Darwin is the key figure. Now, you may think, find it odd having quite a lot on evolution in a lecture about general philosophy, but I want to suggest to you that actually all six of the topics uh, concerned in general philosophy can be illuminated by thinking in terms of evolution. Because with all of these topics, um, we are applying our intelligence to try to understand difficult problems. And if our intelligence is itself the result of an evolutionary process, then that sheds light on how far we can expand expect it to be able to get to the bottom of these things. And there are some more, far, far more specific connections that I'll come to. OK, so there are obvious similarities between humans and animals. People had obviously recognized these forever. Uh, but before Darwin, humans and animals were thought to be radically distinct. Uh, man is made in the image of God. Uh, animals are lower down in the ladder. According to Aristotle, man is uniquely a rational animal. That sets us apart from all the rest. Uh, and this kind of idea was systematized in the great chain of being, of which there is an image there. So this is Aristotle's ladder of nature, systematized by a later philosopher, a Neoplatonist neo called Plotinus. And you can see that that's there's the hierarchy in which he puts things, all fitting neatly into the divine world order. 
Uh, Descartes, again, thought there was a radical distinction between uh, humans and animals. The beasts have no reason at all. They have no intelligence at all. Uh, animals lack reason, perhaps even thought. But nevertheless, uh, physically they're similar to us in certain respects. Their physical bodies act in many ways uh, similarly, but they don't have uh, the immaterial mind. Now along comes Darwin, and I want to give credit here also to Alfred Russell Wallace, who came up with the theory of natural selection at, more or less at the same time as Darwin, actually a bit later. But he was quick to get it out, whereas Darwin had been pondering this for years and years and years, collecting loads of data, but not publishing. Darwin was reluctant to publish uh, because he could see that his work would be extremely controversial and extremely troublesome for those who are religious, including in his own family. But along came Wallace, he wrote to Russell, uh, sorry, <laughs> along came Wallace, he wrote to Darwin, uh, said, here's my theory. Uh, Darwin realized it was the same as his, uh, and they presented together um, the theory of natural selection. So, kind of joint discoverers. Both of them, interestingly, had been inspired by a clergyman, Thomas Malthus. And Thomas Malthus wrote an essay on the principle of population, basically pointing out that uh, animals, the, the, the pace at which a population increases will generally be a geometric series. In other words, the, more, the larger a population is, if it continues to breed at the same rate, then you will get an exponential increase in population. Now that means that even if you somehow manage to increase the food supply by a constant amount year on year, eventually the population is going to outrun the food available. Now, I think it's quite hard to appreciate just what exponential growth does. So I've got here a, a, a little simulation. So imagine a population of rabbits. And that population of rabbits, there's just a hundred of them, and they are bang in the middle of the globe you see there. Okay? Now we've got it so that these rabbits breed at what's actually a fairly modest rate for rabbits, if you've come across the habits of rabbits. <laughs> They're growing at, um, their population is growing at a rate of 10% per generation, just 10%, with two months per generation, 60 days. Okay? And let's see what happens um, when we set this running. One thing about these rabbits, they have no predators, they don't get disease, and they can spread around the world quite quickly. Right? The only constraint on them is you cannot have more than one rabbit per square foot, or if you're metric, about nine per square meter. Okay, so here's, here we go. <laughs> right, that took 52.4 years. Now, <clears throat> that's exponential growth for you. Now, one way you can think about evolution is that unchecked, pretty much any biological species is going to do that. So you've got immense competition. Only a tiny proportion of the possible offspring, or the possible offspring of offspring, or offspring of offspring, offspring of offspring, and so on, only a tiny proportion will survive. Now, if that's so, uh, what's going to determine which one survives? Is it going to be mere chance? Well, there'll be a lot of chance in it, of course. But when you've got that much selection taking place, any factor which biases the chance is going over time to have a, a very big effect. There will be some which stand a slightly better chance of surviving, 
uh, because they're faster or stronger or more immune to certain poisons or able to digest more things or whatever. Uh, and when you've got that level of competition, uh, those advantages are going to tell. So, this is what natural selection is. If animals or plants have these features, their characteristics are largely inherited with some random variation. So, obviously, you can't invariably predict that taller parents will have taller kids. It doesn't always work that way. But by and large, the taller the parents are, the taller the kids are going to be. Right? Some of these characteristics are relevant to survival and reproduction. That's obvious. Out there in nature, uh, where gazelles are being che uh, chased by cheetahs and so forth, uh, being a little bit faster as a gazelle gives you a much better chance of survival. If you can outrun the other one, uh, you're less likely to be caught. And if you're a cheetah, being a little bit faster can enable you to catch a meal where otherwise you wouldn't. They live in a competitive environment. Well, the moral of the program I've just shown you is that more or less everything in nature lives in a competitive environment. There is no way that you can have pure stability and no competition. Um, not in practice. And then natural selection is pretty much inevitable. It's pretty much inevitable that as the generations go on, uh, proportionately more will, con will have what we now call the genes, the, the, the inherited, uh, the code that creates the inherited characteristics that are more conducive to survival. Now, some things can hugely speed this up. Um, I've given the example of cheetahs and gazelles. And where you get coevolution, um, this process can go really, really fast. If you've got gazelles competing against cheetahs, uh, then if you're a gazelle and you are slower than usual, uh, nature is going to have its effect on you very quickly in the form of a fast cheetah. And likewise, the fast cheetahs are going to get a pretty quick reward for being faster. So evolution will run really fast. And again, one can simulate this with computer programs, and it, 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 it's very apparent how introducing this element of competition between uh, two competing species uh, radically can speed things up. Sexual selection is also well worth um, introducing here. Uh, if you have sexually reproducing species, um, then typically um, you've got an asymmetry between females and males. Uh, males are capable of having lots of offspring. Females are far fewer, and therefore females tend to be much more selective. And if females choose their mate according to particular characteristics, and the obvious example is peahens choosing peacocks with impressive tails, that can drive a runaway process. Basically, uh, if um, you're a peacock or a peahen, well, more or less any peahen is going to be able to mate. But amongst the peacocks, some will do very well, and some, I'm afraid, will end up without a partner, because the peahens are being selective. So the competition is far more amongst the males than amongst the females. And as a result, you can get this, you know, the absurdity of a peacock tail, uh, which must hinder the peacock in getting away from prey. But because it's so effective in attracting peahens, uh, that uh, overbalances any, any negatives. OK. so. Evolution is a very sophisticated theory. There's, there's, I've only mentioned a few of the parts of it. It's a very powerful. It explains a, a huge amount. I'm going to uh, spend a fair bit of this lecture now just outlining some of the evidence for evolution and drawing a moral from this. Um, I think it's well worth knowing this because there's a lot of misinformation about this. People like to say, oh, evolution is only a theory. They talk about as though it's less than certain. Um, even when Darwin wrote of the origin of species, um, the, he, the evidence he had was very, very strong. 
But the evidence we now have is absolutely overwhelming because we have found so much that fits in perfectly with the evolutionary story. We've got the fossil record, uh, we've got vestiges, that is um, evidence from the bodies of uh, creatures that now exist, which features that don't make any sense in terms of how they now live, but make perfect sense when seen as inherited from previous species. Uh, got evidence from embryology and development, the way in which uh, fetuses develop, uh, which to some extent recapitulates uh, an evolutionary history. We've got evidence of biogeography, uh, where the anim animals and plants are distributed around the world. And most recently, we've got evidence of genetics. So basically, once, pe once DNA was uh, discovered, and once people started analysing the genetic sequences, lo and behold, it all fitted perfectly with an evolutionary story. So, I mean, you can, there's lots of sources for this. I'm just going to mention a couple of them. One of them is obviously Wikipedia. The other one, I think this is an excellent book, and the authors kindly uh, gave me some images for me to use in this lecture. So, the images here, I, I'm, I, unfortunately, you won't be able to get much from them on the handout, uh, but the important thing is, is the page numbers. Uh, if, you, if you want to follow this up, go and look at the book. You can see where um, these things are. So there are lots of tr transitional forms. When Darwin wrote, uh, people were able to say of him, hang on, if you're right, there should be lots of intermediate forms of animals, uh, intermediate between the ones that we now see. Well, those have since be dis been discovered. Here's one example, Tiktaalik. Uh, discovered in 2004. It seems to be a genuine intermediate between a fish and an amphibian. And the year after Darwin wrote, uh, Archaeopteryx, famously, uh, intermediate between a small dinosaur and a modern bird. And there are lots of others. Here's one example, uh, Indohyus, a sort of ancient pig-like animal and the modern whale. And intermediates have been discovered all the way through. And this makes sense of why the whale has a vestigial pelvis and hind limb. Wouldn't make any sense if the whale was a fish. But explaining the whale as evolved from an animal somewhat like a pig does explain it. Humans and apes, again, in Darwin's time, th there wasn't this uh, richness of intermediate forms, uh, now there are. And you can see um, at the top left you've got Homo sapiens, that's us. Um, at the bottom right you've got the chimp. And there are a load of intermediates. I mean, the, the story of human evolution is a complicated one. There seem to be lots of different species and it's not absolutely clear you know, which descended from what and so on. Uh, what is clear is that there are lots of intermediates. Biogeography, well, there's lots of evidence for continental drift from Earth sciences. Uh, I mean, for example, as, as ocean uh, rifts where you get um, spreading, uh, where the magnetic bands on each side of the rift are kind of match up. And um, the theory of continental drift became very well accepted in the 60s and 70s. Before that, it had been extremely controversial. Um, but if you put that evidence together with biogeography, where fossils are to be found, where different kinds of trees are to be found, it makes lots of sense of what would otherwise be senseless. Instances of bad design. Uh, this is really vestiges. This is cases where we find that <coughs> modern animals, including ourselves, have certain aspects which wouldn't make very good sense from the point of view of an intelligent designer. And one famous example is the, is the blind spot in the eye. I mean, an, another is um, how humans give birth, which is notoriously painful and difficult and potentially um, uh, carrying a, a risk of death in nature. 
But another, a particularly vivid one is this nerve, the, uh, <clears throat> the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, which goes all the way down and back again. And, and that doesn't make any sense at all from a design point of view. But it does make sense if you see as, be, as, as being evolved ultimately from fishes. Okay. Uh, I've not gone in detail through DNA evidence, um, but that I think is also tremendously important. <clears throat> so I just want to point out here um, an important consequence of all this. You will find people who want to deny evolution. Typically they want to do so on religious grounds. But here is why I think if, if you are religious, you should not be going that way. I don't actually think that evolution shows religion to be false. It doesn't show that there's no God. It may show that certain rather narrow fundamentalist views on religion are false, ones that claim, for example, that Genesis gives an accurate story of the creation, but then since there are, there's more than one story in Genesis, that's fairly easy to conclude anyway. But here's the problem. <clears throat> if you think there is a God who did not operate by evolution, but yet gave us all this evidence of evolution in the rocks, in the fossils, in the you know, distribution of plants, in our own DNA, then you have to believe in a creator who actually is deliberately deceiving us. Because why else would all that false evidence be there? And if you believe in a creator who can deceive us, then you've got no reason to believe that holy book on which you are basing your denial of evolution. You can't have it both ways. The, the evidence is there. If that was put there by a designer, then it was put there by a designer who was lying to us, in which case he could lie in other respects as well. Okay, so I, I want to explain why I, I, I think evolution is completely incontrovertible, all right? Uh, this is not a controversial view uh, amongst people who know the evidence. What's the significance of it? <clears throat> well, if we are continuous with animals, and if our faculties have evolved in response to selective pressures over the multitudinous generations, then that tells us something about our rational connection with the world. And when we ask questions like, uh, what can we know? How are we able to predict things about the world? What is the nature of personal identity? What is the nature of freedom or mind and body? If we bear in mind that the brains with which we are trying to get to the bottom of these things are evolved organs, then we shouldn't be so surprised that sometimes our intuitive judgments about things may prove to be radically at odds with the real nature of things. Why be surprised that quantum particles act in ways that we find completely counterintuitive? That's exactly what you'd expect. Because in the evolutionary scenario, an ability to understand quantum particles played no role at all. What was important was to be good with medium-sized objects, like rocks or spears. Being good with quantum particles would have been of no use to you at all. It would just be a waste of brain space. And this goes for a lot of these different topics. So um, from the next lecture, we'll be focusing very specifically on, on these various topics. Uh, but I hope as we go through that, you will bear in mind some of the lessons we've seen from these first two lectures, which I think bear importantly on every single one of the six topics. Thank you.